Uh, we're into gas turbines or gas power plants. We're studying the Brayton cycle. Gas turbines generate a lot of electricity. They're also used on a lot of naval vessels. They're also used on a lot of land vessels like tanks. If you were in the Army, anybody in the Army know about the yeah, tanks use a lot of gas turbines. They don't use diesel pistons, that reciprocating engines. And also helicopters, aircraft. But right now we're just into the power plant. So the basic cycle has a compressor, combustor, and turbine. And the four primary states, one, two, three, four. You do the air standard analysis, just like we did for the auto and diesel so that we simplify it. We have always air, no combustion products. These ideal gas equation is always valid. In any of those states, it's valid. The combustion is simplified. The intake and exhaust is simplified. We just put a heat exchanger for the heat rejection like that. And if you do the cold air standard, the cold just adds that you use constant specific heats, typically evaluated at 298, 25 degrees C. You use these equations just like in the auto and diesel, but this is the most used equation for the Brayton because you have a pressure ratio across the compressor, a pressure ratio, so that P2 over P1 is often given. It's not a compression ratio, but a pressure ratio. So this is the one that we use a lot for the Brayton cycle analysis using constant specific heats. Um, let's take a look at solving one problem. Air standard Brayton cycle operates. They give you the temp pressure and temperature at the compressor inlet. The pressure ratio is a 9, not very high. There's a lot higher. The maximum temperature is 1450K. To often it's based on metallurgical considerations. That first set of turbine blades where that hot exact uh, uh, products coming out of the combustor hit that and it stresses the engine. So if you take a look back at this illustration right here, this looks like the compressor stages, a bunch of them, one, two, three, blah, 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 a bunch of compressor stages and then expansion, okay? So the expansion uh, blades right there get toasty hot and you have to limit their temperatures. There's a lot of interesting ongoing, continuing heat transfer analysis because if you can boost up that maximum temperature coming from the combustor, which is easy just for the fuel and combustion, uh, then you improve the performance. But metallurgically, you can't handle it. So they'll actually do a lot of cooling of those turbine blades. Okay, it's a very active area of research. On the basis of a cold air standard analysis, using these values of specific heat, get the temperature at the compressor outlet and peak temperature. Just walk through the cycle and analyze it. How many people feel they can solve this problem? How many people want me to walk through it? How many people want me to walk through it? Set of hands. First step, try to do this from memory. Get good so that you can know, you could sketch out the the diagram where you have the first part coming in, the compressor, true? So you ingest air at state one into the compressor. Out at state two, it goes into the combustor where there's a lot of heat added. And then out at state three, that's your maximum temperature. T3 is gonna be the max. It's going to be 1450 Kelvin, just to highlight. Then you go into the turbine. And then for the air standard Brayton cycle, you go to a heat exchanger to finish the cycle. So there's really four states, one, two, three, four. And what you want to do is probably make a table of uh, properties. So state one. Now, when you go through the compressor, you could go 2S, 2Actual, depending if they give you isotropic efficiency for that compressor. You look at it. Did they give me an isotropic efficiency for that compressor? 
No, so just leave it. I'm going to leave 2s there to remind you. Sometimes they'll give you that, and then you need to do, you know, like two states, twos. Then uh, state three, then 4s, four, and then that's it. I think that would be, for this problem, the most number of states that we would have. Get the pressure in kilopascal or something and temperature in Kelvin and put in the values that are given. So it's coming in at 90 and 300. Its maximum temperature is 1450. And I think those are the only the hard numbers. The compressor pressure ratio is 9. So guess what the pressure at state 2 is? 9 times 90. See that? So what is 9 times 90? 810 kPa. And is there a pressure drop? Maybe I should color code this. We had to use our brain to get that one. Okay? And there's no state 4S, so we'll just skip that one. 2S and 4S. So now what about pressure at 3? It's the same as 2. So it's 810. We used our brain to get that one. All right? Okay. What about the pressure at 4? It's the same as 1. Why? It's just a heat exchanger, negligible pressure drop. So we got our pressures fairly easy. How do I get my temperatures at state 2? How do I get this, this temperature right here, this temperature at state 2? It's air, ideal gas, undergoing isentropic compression. Maybe we should have sketched also a, a diagram, get good at sketching maybe a temperature entropy diagram for this process. State 1 to state 2, it's going to be compressed. The pressure's going up, the temperature's going up. S is constant, straight up on a TS diagram. 2 is straight above 1. Then what? We have constant pressure heating. Pressure is equal to a constant up to state 3. 3 to 4, we have isentropic expansion, true. And then 4 back to 1, pressure is equal to a constant. So that may help us a lot. So now, what is our equation for T2? Yeah, it's P. It's T1. It's, it's using that equation I just showed analytically. It's T1 times P2 over P1. That's our pressure ratio, which is 9 for this problem, to the K minus 1 divided by K. Thumbs up if you agree. You see where that comes from? And so um, I can ch we can jump on that and calculate. What about the temperature at 4? Well... It's going to be the temperature at 3, and then we're going to do isentropic expansion. Then we're going to have pressure at 4 divided by pressure at 3 to the K minus 1 over K. You just got to get the subscripts correct. But instead of having that pressure ratio of a 9, it'll be 1 over 9, 1 ninth. So the temperature at 4 will be a lot lower than the temperature at 3. This, this product, you know, you're multiplying something times T3, that'll be less than 1. We're here, you're multiplying something times T1. That's greater than 1. Once you have those temperatures, you're pretty well locked in, right? Because we do a first law analysis. What about the work into the compressor? That's the specific heat times T2 minus T1. It's a change in H's. I, I'm running out of room, so I just write it as C sub P delta T. The Q in the combustor is equal to C sub P, T3 minus T2. The work out of the turbine, notice I put the positive work into the compressor, positive work out of the turbine. So all of these works and Qs I'm calculating as positive quantities. When I do the sum for the Q net and work net, I'll have to insert a negative sign in front of some of them where it's, it's a... Q out, that's a negative Q, and a work in, that's a negative work. So this is C sub P, T3 minus T4, and this is a Q out heat exchanger, C sub P, T4 
4 minus T1. I pause because I sometimes make errors, and I want you to see if I've made an error. If you like it, if it's all good, give me a thumbs up. I'll wait for a few more thumbs up. All right, I'm getting a few. Are you good with it? You're good? All right. Anybody want a question or just ask me to clarify one of these? Okay. If not, then we'll proceed. So what we want to do is we want to calculate uh, the peak temperature. Let me see. I already calculated some of these. I didn't mark them in. The temperature at the compressor outlet. I already calculated that. Isn't that T2? Right there. Uh, the peak pressure, we already calculated that. That was 810, um, like P2. Um, what is the temperature at the turbine outlet? Uh, that's going to be this T4. Uh, the heat addition in the burner, which is Q combustor, right here. The net work of the cycle. Okay, now W net is going to be the work of the turbine positive out minus the work going back to drive the compressor. True? That's the answer for part E. What is the thermal efficiency? It's going to be the net work positive out divided by the answer for part D, which is Q into the combustor or burner. Okay, so it'll be a ratio of work net divided by Q combustor. And then the back work ratio, the last one, this is the thermal efficiency, back work ratio, is equal to the work needed to drive the compressor divided by the work that the turbine produced. All right? See if I have some numbers for you to finish this out. This number, 562.0. This number, 774. The uh, Q of the combustor is 800. Uh, this number right here is 892 kilojoules per kilogram. The work net of the cycle was 416 kilojoules per kilogram. The thermal efficiency comes right in at 46.6% thermal efficiency. And the back work ratio is 38.8%. Notice we had the back work ratio for the vapor power cycles down in the 1% region. A lot of times even less than 1%. It doesn't take much work to boost the pressure of liquids. It takes a lot of work to boost the pressure of vapors or gases. Hence, the back work ratio for the Brayton cycle is out of this world, high, 40%, right? Look at this, nearly 40%. Four, because of the gases, it, you're, you're, you're compressing ideal gas. It takes a lot of work. All right? All right. Um, there's another point I was going to make. Somebody says, didn't we learn the thermal efficiency is equal to, uh, not, yeah, the thermal efficiency is equal to 1 minus 1 over the pressure ratio raised to the K minus 1 over K. It's in the book. I've derived it before. I know I've derived it and put it on the internet, this der derivation. Yes? Sure, that's a good one. Okay, they're going to give you T3. They're go it's just one of these things. It's like uh, there's so many equations and so many unknowns, and they have to give you something so that you don't have an indeterminate system where you have too many equations, not enough on un not enough knowns, right? So. Uh, so basically, the, the pattern is, is they give you the maximum temperature. I'm trying to think of a problem where they have it, and I can't think of any problem in the textbook where they did that. Um, but they give you something else that allows you to calculate it then. 
Maybe they say find the pressure ratio, the maximum pressure ratio. They give you heat transfer. They give you heat transfer? Yeah. Let me come back. Let me finish this comment right here. There's an analytic expression for the thermal efficiency. Guess what? It agrees. Just put in the pressure ratio. Our pressure ratio for this problem was 9, and the K, 1.4. Boom, you get it. Now, you wanted to see the other diagram, which is a pressure volume diagram. It's good to plot both of them. You have two pressures. You have only two pressure lines, high and low. The combustor is at the high pressure, and the, the other heat exchanger right here is a low pressure. This is the pressure low. This is pressure high. So pressure at state 2 is equal to pressure at state 3. It's high pressure. Pressure at state 1 is equal to the pressure at state 4. That's the low pressure. So somewhere around here, somewhere around here, we know two pressures lie on those lines. Okay. So now we think, okay, let's put 1 here. And now I'm going to boost its pressure. So 2 is going to be on that high pressure. Uh, is it going to be compressed? or expanded. It's going to be compressed and so from our experience state 2 is, is like that. Now at constant pressure we're going to heat it up in a combustor. Where is state 3 going to be? It'll be same pressure. Walk it way over here to state 3. Maybe you don't walk it that far. Okay, Maybe I moved it too far. But then you expand it through the turbine. Where is state 4 going to be? It'll be Lower pressure right there. Got it? Right? Now, somebody might say, I recall we learned lines of constant temperature on a PV diagram. On a PV diagram for an ideal gas, PV is equal to RT. What does a line of constant temperature look like? Those are called isotherms. True? Which line, would this be a higher temperature and this would be a lower temperature? So this is regions of increasing temperature. And so how could we blend that information in here? Well, it'd be like this would be a line of real high temperature, different temperature, temperatures and temperatures. It's not that inform informative, but it shows you lines of constant temperature. We have four unique temperatures. <laughs> you, you can see it here. One, two, three. Four, you know, they're not the same temperature. All right. Typically, four is greater than two. As shown, this would be T1, this would be T2, this would be T4, this would be T3. What is the motivation for having a regenerative Brighton cycle? Well, it's the same motivation we had for regenerative vapor power cycle. What? Do we have regeneration when we talked about the Rankine cycle? We did. Okay, it was two weeks ago. What is the concept between the regeneration in the Rankine vapor power cycle? We had open and closed feed water heaters in the Rankine cycle to promote regeneration. Okay? So... Why, why did the open and closed feed water heaters work? Bring in water at higher temperatures. Such that in the boiler, the expensive fuel brought in heat into the working fluid, and the working fluid was already warm. So anytime you're bringing heat into the cycle, into the working fluid, and the temperature of the working fluid is low, bad for efficiency. Try to bring in heat at a high temperature into your cycle. So where do we bring in heat? in the combustor, state two to three. Is some of the temperature that's being, some of the heat has to be brought in in the combustor to change the temperature from two to a little bit more, the little bit more, until you're bringing in all this heat and it's boosting the temperature as it's flowing through the combustor, right? Until it finally goes out at three. So where is the opportunity to improve the efficiency for the engineer? Don't use expensive fuel to do that heating. Find some other warm gas somewhere or some heat source in the cycle 
that you can re-divert or pipe over to something like a quote-unquote feed water heater. So where would you find that? I want to preheat right in here. I would like to now not bring in the gas at 2. I would like to bring the gas in at, uh, do they call this X or Y? X. I'm trying to be consistent with the book. You're reading the book. You want your lectures to be consistent with the book. So I try to use the same syntax and notation, etc. The book uses X for a state, not a number. This is a change. A letter for a state, this is the first, okay? So state X comes out of some, I'm going to call it open feed water heater, closed feed water heater, but it's not. I'm just trying to link in to what we just studied and learned, the vapor power cycle. Where am I going to get something to heat it with? You're throwing heat away here. Maybe this temperature is hot. Hey, look at this TS diagram. Is the temperature at state 4 greater than the temperature at state 2? Because I have, I, I would break this right here, and I, I would just go like this. And I'd have a heat exchanger. And I would try to cool this exhaust gas before, I know I, I'm going to, this is not a combustor. What is this? This is a, just a heat exchanger. Before I have to put it through, finally, a heat exchanger to throw some heat away to the atmosphere and, and turn it around and close the loop, right? So this we break and re re reroute. So this is state four. And then what comes out of this heat exchanger is state Y. All right, looking at temperatures, if we cool down this gases, what's the lowest temperature Y could be? Could, be, could Y be below t the temperature at 2? No. That's the lowest Y could be. What's the highest X could be? Could it be higher than the temperature at 4? No. Nope. That's the highest it could be. If you had a really big, 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 big heat exchanger with a lot of surface area and a long time for those gases to exchange heat, and it was in a counter flow configuration, meaning that the... The, the cool gases are coming like this, and the warm gases are going like that, such that what the warm gases going out match the temperature of the cool gases coming in, and the cool gases going out match the temperature of the warm gases going in. You have the best heat exchanger, and because this M dot is the same as this M dot, and this C sub P is the same as this C sub P, they're the same, right? that one temperature increase of the cool gas equals one temperature decrease of the hot gas. So, so this is the maximum temperature that you can get for state um, X, right? They call that state X. And this is the minimum temperature for state Y. So that's the idea. All of this heating then was performed using not the expensive fuel in the combustor, but inside the cycle. Do you think it'll improve performance? Yes. And from an entropy trans uh, standpoint, this brings a lot of entropy in the system. Heat at low temperature coming into the system brings a lot of entropy. Heat uh, at high temperature coming into the system brings in less entropy for the same kilojoule of heat brought in. You're going to have to throw that entropy out of the cycle, plus any irreversibilities. Let's just forget about the irreversibilities, no entropy generation. So what comes in has to be thrown out. And I have to throw it out. I'd like to throw out a lot if I can throw out the heat at low temperature. So there you go. So from an entropy balance point of view, it's great. It improves the performance to bring in all the heat at high temperature. So here it is. You just put that heat exchanger. You call that a regenerator. You, they call it a regenerator. And you introduce state X and state Y. Notice that the state X has to be a little below the temperature. At X has to be a little bit below temperature at 4. Or it could be the maximum. It could be the temperature 4. Likewise, the temperature at Y 
has to be a little above or the lowest it can be is the temperature at 2. They introduce a regenerator effectiveness. They could have called it an efficiency, but they didn't, so I'm going to call it an effectiveness. And the generator effectiveness is in terms of the enthalpies, okay? So at the enthalpy of X minus the enthalpy of 2, that's how much heat was transferred into the working fluid. It's this enthalpy change, Hx minus H2, right? Divided by what is the maximum enthalpy change that you could have anticipated. And that would be the enthalpy at state 4 minus enthalpy at state 2. So this number would be less than or equal to 100%. Look good? What's another modification to improve the performance? Reheat. Instead of having go back to a boiler or a steam generator, you could just have two combustors. You have your expensive fuel feeding both combustor, and you're bringing in some heat in the combustor, the first combustor, and then some heat into the second combustor. So basically, that's the reheat concept integrated into a regenerative Brayton cycle. So we're going to leave that heat exchanger here. That's great for performance, and heat exchangers are pretty simple devices, right? The combustor, right here, you bring in more heat here and right there. All right, you have to have two turbine stages. What does it look like on a TS diagram? Well, they introduce state A, hey, another letter, and state B, another letter. And so they're leaving on the corners one, two, three, and four, that original numbering for our states. Expand isentropically, constant S, to an intermediate pressure, put it through another combustor, the second combustor, add more heat. When you add more heat, you probably stop because of a maximum temperature limit because of metallurgical considerations. And then expand again to state four, what comes out. So that's reheat. What are you trying to do? You're trying to bring in more heat at these higher temperatures. Bring in all your heat at high temperature. Great for performance. There's one more modification. I hate to give it to you, but I just it's like a pill, right? Take your medicine. Here's, here it is. So we covered regeneration. We covered reheat. And the last one, is intercooling, intercooling. So we're going to have the standard Brayton cycle enhanced with a regenerative heat exchanger, enhanced with reheat, so we have more than one combustor, more than one turbine, and we're going to have intercooling, which means we're going to split the compressor into two stages, and in between the two stages we'll have an intercooler. Inner cooter. Why did I pick the term inner? In, in between the two compressor stages. Okay, so we have compressor one and compressor two, and we have an intermediate heat exchanger between them. And the purpose is to reject heat. So you're putting in work into the first compressor. That's a W. You put in work into the second compressor, right? Because you have the intercooler and you're rejecting some energy out to the atmosphere, somehow the sum of WC1 and WC2 is less than just WC if you only had one compressor without an intercooler. Why? 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 Why use intercooling? This is a very difficult concept for thermal students. I mean, it's not, it's always ideal gas, right? Always ideal gas. But it's the same concept that it takes less energy to boost the pressure of a compressed liquid than an ideal gas. So it's the same concept, but we're not turning it into a liquid. But, but why? It's, the answer is in chapter 6. What? The answer is in chapter 6. The very last section of chapter 6 deals with the minimum work, this equation right here. Does that equation look familiar? Doesn't it look like the equation that we modified for the pump, VDP? 
But here they didn't take the V outside. They didn't take the V outside because V is not equal to a constant for our problem. If it, it was a constant, like compressing a liquid or boosting the pressure of a liquid, then that comes outside, it makes it a little simpler. But do you, do, do you, reckon, do you recognize this equation? And what it says is the minimum work per unit mass required to boost the pressure from P1 to P2, neglecting changes in kinetic and potential energy and no heat transfer, is the, the lowest amount of work, the least amount of work. It's reversible. That's that int rev is equal to the negative VDP. Kat, you encouraged me to draw the pressure volume diagram, right? And we said that at this low pressure and that high pressure, and we said we we're going to st throw state one here, and we're going to compress it to go to here, right? Now look at this area right here. To the left of the curve on a PV diagram is that minimum work. Now let me ask you, should I take and start state one here? and compress isentropically to get up to the same pressure? Or is case two better than case one? Which one will require less work? Case two will require less work. To boost the pressure from P1 to P2. You can see it. Why? Because the V is larger on average for the first case than the second case, right? Okay, where is a water? The water's like right here, very low V, and it doesn't change when I boost the pressure going up in a water pump. But now we're dealing with ideal gases, S equal to a constant, S equal to a constant. Guess what? This one was a hotter gas, to start with. This is a cooler gas to start with. Start with cool gases and boost the pressure. That's always good. It'll take less energy to boost the pressure of a cool gas than a hot gas. All right. But you use now this same concept here is what, what let's say I, I start with the gas that's the blue line, right? We're going to start with the, the gas that's, that's right here. Okay, this is state one. We're going to state two. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say, look, it, start to compress it, but when you get up to some intermediate pressure, pressure, I don't know, call it C, because that's what they're going to call it. C, pressure, it's letter, letter C. Stop the compression, right? If I stop the compression, Remember, my isotherms looked like this. The temperature at C is greater than the temperature at 1. What should I do? Cool it. Put it in a heat exchanger and cool it down. If you put it in a heat exchanger at constant pressure and cool it down, this isotherm is T1. You're going to cool it to let this. Now you're at some cool state. Let's call it D. So this was state C, this is now state D. And now I put it through another reversible stage compressor. It's isentropic, and I, 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 uh, I go like this, up to final state 2. So instead of going from 1 to 2 the whole way, I go 1 to C, stop and cool it, down to what temperature? Let's get the temperature at D equal to the temperature at 1. Cool it back down to the ambient temperature. Then finish off the, the compression. So it goes like this, this, this. Guess what this is a visual representation of? The difference between the two amounts of work. It's the work saved by using the intercooler. So uh, this area right here is, whoops, all the way over to the x-axis, uh, y-axis. That is the work for the first compressor. 
Then this is the work for the second compressor, work of the second compressor, and they're less than the first without any intercooling. Right? That's what I'm trying to draw with this equation right here. When I have two work inputs to stages, compressor one and compressor two, with the intercooler throwing away some heat, cooling it off, it's going to re require less work than just having one compressor stage without any intercooling. That's visually the savings, the work saved. Okay. Now let's put it on a TS diagram. Here it is. You take, can compress it isentropically. You cool it back. Typically, TD and T1 are the same temperature. You cool it back to 300 Kelvin. Then you compress again from T, uh, D to 2. Now, depending where, how much you compress, the first time you compress, the temperature at C could be up here. It could be above T2. And then you cool it and then compress. There's no relationship that where TC has to be, it could be above or below uh, 2. There's, but the way I drew it, I have to draw it some way. I show that TC is less than T2. I could have shown that TC is equal to T2 or TC greater than T2. Okay? All right. So now, uh, this is the reason why intercooling is better for performance. It requires less compressor work. The back work ratio will be less. The efficiency will be greater. So guess what? This is now what a standard gas power plant may look like. They'll have a regenerator. Money. Little engineering, save a lot of money. They'll have more than one turbine stage, probably just two, with two combustors. Good for performance. And they'll have intercooling. Good for performance. Will they have four or five? No, they probably just one or two. Okay? Intercoolers. How many people have heard this term intercooler in automotive applications? One, two, three, four, five, six. Turbochargers. That's exactly right. So in a turbocharged engine, where do they have the intercooler? Where does it fit in the cycle in the system? Right. So the turbocharger has two sides of it. Let's follow the fresh air, the outdoor air that's ingested for the combustion, right? It goes through one side of the turbocharger and the boost the pressure. But now it's pressure is high, but the temperature is also high. And you would like to have the pressure high, but the temperature low as you ingest it into your engine. So what do you do? You put it into an, in, an intercooler, which is constant pressure heat reject, a heat exchanger to reject some heat to cool it off. The oxygen gets really compact because of the high pressure, and now it's lower temperature, and you can stuff a lot of air, a lot of oxygen, into the cylinder. Now you could throw more fuel in it, and you can get a bigger bang, and without increasing the displacement volume of your engine, your turbocharged 2 liter will feel like a 3 liter. That's it. And the fuel efficiency will be higher, too. Anybody ever see a car with a supercharger, not a turbocharger? They'll have intercoolers there, too. The difference is, instead of using exhaust gas to help drive a turbine in the, in the um, turbocharger to compress the intake air, you'll use the mechanical power off the crank in a supercharger. Well, there you go. So we do see the term intercooler associated with internal combustion engines, but now here it's with the Brayton cycle. Okay. Oh, boy. It takes us half an hour to read the problem. <laughs> Let's go. So we have a regenerative gas turbine with one intercooler and one reheat, or it's really a second combustor when you have two combustors. All right. Operating at steady state. The inlet to the first compressor is 100 kPa, 300 Kelvin. The inlet to the second compressor, so the compressor takes the pressure, boosts it by a factor of four, but now you're going to cool it after the intercooler and before the second compressor, it's back down to 300 Kelvin. The, the inlet 
uh, the first turbine is 1,100 kilopascal, so the second compressor took it from 400 to 1,100 kilopascal. And there is your typically you specify the maximum temperature 1450. The inlet to the second turbine is 400 kilopascal and 1450. And isentropic efficiency of each compressor is 75%, and each turbine is 88%. And the regenerator effectiveness is 80%. This will take you a while to solve. Get your illustration. I already drew it, okay? Uh, should I redraw it real fast? So you have to have uh, compressor one, the intercooler, the compressor two. Then we're going to go through a heat exchanger, which is a regenerate, regenerator. Just call it Regen, R-E-G, heat exchanger. Then we'll go into the combustor, uh, CB1. Then we'll go into uh, turbine 1. Then we'll go into CB2, combustor 2. Then we'll go into turbine 2. Then we'll come out of that turbine and go back to the regenerator. So inlet to the compressor, out to the intercooler. Inlet to the second compressor, to the regenerator, combustor, etc. Let's number our states. We're going to leave this state one, leave this state two, put this state three, and put this state four to be consistent with our textbook and introduce letters. So this is state X. This is state Y, this is state A, this is state B, this is state C, and state D. And I really encourage you to draw it from memory. I know it's tough, but you'll learn a lot more. And now the TS diagram. All right, the TS diagram that I showed earlier was only for reversible compressor stages, reversible, blah, blah, blah. So now we're going to have to struggle with a little bit. Uh, start at state one, and we're going to compress it and stop when we hit that pressure of 400 kPa. All right, so this is a temperature entropy diagram. Lines of constant pressure run this way. That's a line of constant pressure. Maybe I should color code it, not red, color code it something else, blue. Okay, so we, we go 1 to C, isn't it? State C, then stop. Then we're going to bring it down to a temperature uh, all the way down, whoops, to the same temperature as state 1. So this is D, and then we compress, and we'll stop right there. That's state 2. Okay. Then we're going to uh, get eventually up to state 3, somewhere state X is. And that heating from 2 to X comes in the regenerator. But from X to 3, that heating comes in the first combustor. Then we'll expand, stop at state A, reheat in the second combustor to state B, and expand down to the low pressure. Notice that um, for this problem, uh, this the pressure at 2, the pressure at X, and the pressure at 3 are all the same pressure, and it's uh, 1,100 kPa. The pressure at A and B and C and D just happen to all be 400 kPa. They don't have to be. That intermediate pressure for the intercooler could be different than for the second combustor. But for this problem, they're the same pressure, 400 kPa. And then this pressure right in here is my 100 kPa. True? So let's put on here, this is state 4. Where is state Y? Y is somewhere like this. Can the temperature at Y be less than the temperature at X? Yes, it can for a counterflow heat exchanger. All right. Now, once you have all those, just walk through the cycle carefully. 
uh, I need to modify because if it's irreversible, you're going to have 2C, uh, CS, and then C actual. And then D will still be here, but you'll have 2S and 2 actual because of the eff efficiency of the compressor. How about for the turbine? You'll have AS and A actual. You'll have 4S and 4, well, there's 4S and the 4 actual right there. Okay? So you're going to have to handle each stage of the compressor and each stage of the turbine. Likewise, the effectiveness of the regenerator means that the temperature of X is less than the temperature at 4. And the temperature of Y is above the temperature at 2. Okay? I should have put the, this one right here. It's, it's 4 that it comes across and 2 that it comes across, okay? So I showed Y in a bad location. Looks like I'm out of time. Um, I'll see you Friday. Thank you. Uh, right here? It, you just put it into a heat exchanger to throw it to the ambient. Yep. Yep.